Okay. Now we are ready to uh, go into chapter two. We've done the background. And we've talked about really lots of things to do or to avoid doing, haven't we? When we're creating our samples, mistakes to avoid. In continuing in chapter two, we are really moving into what's called descriptive statistics, as opposed to inferential statistics. There's a little bit of a white lie, but for the most part, 105, we're doing descriptive statistics until the end of the class. And all of 106 should do inferential statistics. And more than heavy duty mathematics over here. But that doesn't mean this is important. Most of the bulk of the statistics you see in your real world life every day in out on TV shows or blogospheres or newspaper articles, I would call as descriptive statistics. And the whole goal then is to, well, I guess it's pretty obvious, we're going to try to describe data. The nature of our challenges, remember we're the whole context is the population. You want to know something about this group of individuals, say. And if you take the case of uh, you're studying the United States population, and there's 200 million, even if you had 200 million pieces of information, if we were studying the heights of the average American, right? We had 250 million numbers. That's far too much to digest, isn't it? can't deal with that. An awful lot of statistics, descriptive statistics, is taking large piles of numbers and distilling it into either a few numbers, a few tables, or a few charts that describe what's actually going on there. Because we human beings, we can't deal with huge piles of numbers. We need a way to get a sense of what's going on without looking at it bit by bit by bit. When we ask questions about the population, there's three different types of questions we often ask, and uh, these are called characteristics of the data. Let's go back to this example. Suppose my population was the uh, all adults in the United States, and I'm studying height. Well, what do I want to know about height? One kind of... Uh, one piece of information we're often interested in is this concept of the center, right? I like to know kind of where most of Americans are with regard to height. And there's lots of ways I can measure that. The one we're most familiar with is average. Actually, we're going to call that the mean in this course. But there's medians, and there's modes, and there's mid-ranges, and there's byways. But for now, just think of this generally, yes, these are kinds of information that help us describe our population. One thing we like to know about is the center. Variation is another really, really important concept. And it can be hard to kind of get your hands around this. But without that measure of variation, your measure of center is quite often be very suspect, not really useful. Here's an example to describe what we mean by variation of data. Now I'm going to switch context and we're going to study the core cadets. So there's 1,500 of you, I'm going to line you up in a straight line. And what I'm studying is your height. Now, the variation in your height is very, it's easy to observe because just as I look at you, heads are going to move up and down and up and down. And the degree to which those go up and down is this concept that I call variation. How much do the values change? And we're going to come up with ways to measure that so that we can compare one population, say the population of the entire Corps of Cadet, the variation in their heights with the variation, say, in a company. Now, which would be bigger, do you suppose? Is there more variation in the heights of the whole core cadet or within a particular company? Whole core. Because you're roughly organized by height. 
All right, to, so to keep this concept of variation in mind, what it means, just think of those examples. That's a perfect example of how variation is reduced by changing the population, the subset you're working with. Variation, the degree of spread, dispersion, the amount of the data values change. A third way we describe a set of data is a concept of the distribution. And this is a little harder to get your hands on. Right. So today we will be creating distributions of data sets and studying them. Outliers is just a reference to the fact that whenever you're doing statistics, you have to be alert to the fact that some data values are way out there. <coughs> now they might be way out there, it might be legitimate values. I don't know if we have a seven footer in the core, do we? We have six nine. Six nine. That person is probably an outlier, meaning a data point very different from the others. Sometimes outliers are legitimate data points and we need to incorporate them. Other times, depending on the statistics we're calculating, they can really mollex things up. So you have to be alert to that. Some statistics are very sensitive to outliers. That means their value will change a lot if there's an outlier. And other statistics aren't sensitive at all to outliers. In our course 105, we don't do the, the time varying uh, statistics. That's one thing we admit in the syllabus. All right, just a little bit of a, a thought experiment here. As you know by now, I, I like to stress the big picture before we get down in the weeds. There's plenty of weeds to get in, so don't worry. We'll be there, all right? Let's think about this process of describing a set of data with a number. Keep in mind, we're distilling, we're throwing away a lot of information, right? If you really wanted to study the heights of the core of the cadets, the definitive answer is what? It's 1,500 numbers. If I distill it down to a single number, your average, well, that's kind of helpful, but you always need to keep in mind what have I thrown away? What else don't I know? Here's a kind of silly little example that will emphasize this. I want all of you to calculate a statistic for me. The population is the set of all human beings. So there's seven billion roughly. You've got a clean sheet of paper that can lots of lines on it. I want you to calculate for the human race the mean number of feet per human. And by that, I mean these <coughs> things attached to your ankles. How much time do you need? Are you done already? Who's got an answer? Two. Two. Hmm. Anybody else? Arnold, is that what you got? Uh, no, I'm saying yeah, I've done <laughs> This is too obvious. What's wrong here? Is the answer? Consuming the entire human population, the mean number of feet per human, is that answer to? Not necessarily. Not necessarily because <coughs> amputees are people born without We've got amputees, we got paraplegics, we got. There are human beings that don't have two feet. So the average would be 1.999 and something like that. And you just might imagine if we did have a intelligent life from another planet coming here and wanting to get to know about human beings and you were the representative describing human beings to this alien life form, you said, well, we have 1.99999 feet per human being. What would they know about you? If they never even seen a human being, but they knew these human beings have 1.9999 feet per body. Would that be, a, uh, be considered an ally though? So like, just well, you wouldn't know with that single number. You wouldn't know that some of these people have a thousand feet, others have no feet, and it averages out to 1.99. A silly little example, but just keep in mind when we when we create statistics, we are deliberately and hopefully thoughtfully and carefully distilling big piles of data into charts, graphs, and maybe just a few numbers. 
And when we do that, we have to be responsible and make sure that we're not tossing out too much. And we also have to be responsible when we interpret it to know the limits of what we can conclude from it. All right, with that, I think I'll go and skip that example. <laughs> What we're going to work on today are frequency distributions. It's a way of graphically distilling larger data sets into smaller ones so we can get our mind around it to see what's going on. And we'll be doing tables first, uh, frequency distributions, uh, cumulative frequency distributions, relative frequency distributions. And then on Friday, we flip the switch and actually go into graphics. So here's the idea. I can't manage a large set of data points, so I'm going to categorize them into a smaller set and make the observations on that smaller set. Let's, uh, let's actually get started here. Yeah. Let me motivate it by, there's a set of numbers. <coughs> Those are a set of IQ scores. If you just look at those numbers, what can you tell? It's not real obvious, is it? What's going on there? Your eyes wandering around, occasionally you might see something above 100, you might see a low one. How can I describe that set of numbers using a distribution? And the way we're going to do that is this concept of a frequency distribution. And here's a general recipe on how to create a frequency distribution. And this isn't precise, it's a little bit of an art form. But general, this is the approach we would take. We want to know how many classes we're going to study. So in that set of data, there might have been 100, 200 data points. That's too many to, to, uh, to consider at once. Any psych majors in here? Have you ever heard the seven plus or minus two famous study? No? I forget who did it, but the average human in their short-term memory can use, work with, understand seven plus or minus two things at once. A good range then for classes is between five and 20, a small number, right? So that we can get our heads around it. We want to distill a large data set into a smaller set. Well, how do we calculate uh, these values, these classes? Well, what we do is we look at the max and the min value, that difference, and we divide that by our target for the number of classes, and we get a class width. Now, this is all going to make a lot more sense. We're going to go back to this raw data and do it. Okay, so this is the recipe. Then we're going to pick the minimum data values and the maximums and come up with a set of classes <coughs> that categorize our data. Let's actually look at it. It'll be easier than actually trying to explain what to do. That's the raw data. If you look through there, you would see that they range from 56 to 142. All right, so I've got to, in my table, in my description of the data, I have to somehow uh, convey that it starts as low as 56 and goes up to 141. And that difference is 85. If I want to do that with five classes, basically distill it down to five pieces of information, then the width has to be about 17. Right, here's the first rule of thumb in doing frequency tables. Pick numbers that are easy to work with. I'm not going to work with a class with a 17. I'll work with 5 or 10 or 20 or 100. Some nice, easy number to work with. So 20. 20 is going to be my class width. I'll have to start at 50 to pick up this lowest one, 56. And then I'll go by 20s all the way up to 130. 
In other words, I'm going to take all those IQ scores that range from 150, uh, from 56 to 141, and I'm going to collapse them into these five classes. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm just going to count how many IQ scores fall in each of those classes. Okay, let's take the next step. Here are my five classes. And if you went through that table and you looked at each IQ score, and when you looked at it, <coughs> it, it just they would put a little tick mark. It's either in this class, this class, and so on. And just count the number of times an IQ score falls in a given class. Hence the name frequency table. How frequently does the data value end up in this range. That's all we've counted here. Right? The class width of what we've constructed is 20. Now you might say, wait, it's 19. 50 minus 60, uh, 69 minus 50. Well, yeah, you might say that, but the convention is to take the difference of succeeding class start points, and that you call that the class width. So the class width here is 70 minus 50 or 20. Our classes are 20 wide. And these are the number of IQ scores that occurred in each of those. Now, I, we've got more terminology coming up here in a minute. But just looking at that table, that table as opposed to that, which is better? for an overall understanding of these IQ scores. You can either work with that, or you can work with this. What kind of conclusions can you draw by just looking at that? What's something that jumps out at you? You can get an immediate number of people who were in a certain range. Sure. How many people had an IQ greater than 130? How many people had an IQ between 110 and 150. It seems like where is the most common IQ range in this group? Yeah, right here is the most common one, and just about everyone is between 70 and 110. Okay? Now you can tell that now very quickly by looking at that table, can't you? But I defy you to tell to glean that information by just looking at that can't do it, can you? And that's why we create frequency tables. <coughs> now let me go through some kind of dry terminology here, all right? Then we'll quickly, I want you to start working on creating your own frequency tables. The lower limits, pretty self-explanatory of each class. <laughs> the upper limits, same idea, that's the upper end of each class. The class boundaries. Well, if this class starts at, stops at 69 and this one starts at 70, then the middle of that, 69.5, is called the boundary. So really, if you had an IQ of 69.4, I don't know if they have decimal IQs. It's a, it'd be less than that boundary, it would go with that class. Class midpoints. As it suggests, you would take the average of the upper and lower value in each class.